Grappling with tragedy, a massacre during a Lunar New Year celebration that's left the people of Monterey Park reeling as officials look into a possible motive. Members of the tight-knit Asian American community open up about their pain and remember the lives lost. How can you even come to reason that somebody would even think about doing something like this? Plus, hearing from the survivors, those impacted reveal the terrifying moments the gunman opened fire. I heard the, the, the stun like a bullet. I suddenly my, my leg get, get hurt. And the heroes, the bystanders who put themselves in harm's way to protect their community. I, I realized I needed to get the weapon away from him, disarm him, or else everybody would have died. Good evening, everyone. I'm Lindsay Davis. We thank you so much for streaming with us. As we enter the year of the rabbit, a symbol long associated with peace, tonight that peace has been shattered for a grieving city in Southern California and well beyond. An Asian American community left shell shocked after yet another mass shooting. This one taking place during a celebration of the Lunar New Year, one of the most important celebrations of the year for East and Southeast Asian cultures. And as we come on the air tonight, we are learning about another deadly shooting, this time at a school in Iowa that's left multiple people dead. More on that in a moment. But we begin with the wounds still so fresh from the horrific shooting in Monterey Park Saturday night. At least 11 people are dead, nine others injured after a shooter opened fire inside a dance studio. Most of them victims are in their 60s. And it could have been even worse if a 26-year-old man hadn't wrestled the semi-automatic gun from the suspected shooter's hand at a second dance studio where he visited. And that gun proved critical in identifying the suspected shooter. We'll hear from that young man in a moment. Tonight, many are wondering why Monterey Park and if any warning signs may have been missed. Let's bring in Arcana Whitworth, who's been on the ground in Monterey Park, where a grieving community is struggling to cope and try to make sense of it all. Hey, Kana. Uh, certainly, Lindsay. So here in Monterey Park, people are showing really a tremendous amount of resilience. We're already seeing people back out shopping. They're out in the community. I want to show you behind me. You can also see this sort of growing memorial. And while people are trying to come back and show that resilience, it is still somber. Yesterday, of course, was the first day of the Chinese New Year. As you mentioned, Lindsay, the year of the rabbit. Today, families should be gathering, visiting relatives. And today, those that are here that have that opportunity, they know it's a privilege and they are not overlooking it. This is a community that honors those older generations. And for many, they see this attack as an attack on their grandparents. So again, as people continue to come into this community, continue to gather at this memorial and add flowers, the fear will not grow along with that growing memorial, right? So I want to share with you this woman who was at the Star Dance Hall. It's right there behind me. And she was there when this shooting broke out. And she says that she is alive today because her dance party partner saved her life. After the suspect do the, uh, the shooting finish, he left. And then I called my partner, wake up, wake up, he don't wake up. And I realized all oh, my hands are blood. I mean, could you imagine going through something like that? Now, she, this is not the only heroic story that we're hearing as this community rises up. Uh, this shooting, as terrible as it was, could have been so much worse. The gunman was actually confronted and stopped when he tried to enter a second location with a semi-automatic weapon that police say had an extended large capacity magazine. One man wrestling it away, likely saving countless lives. The gunman then leading the SWAT team on a massive manhunt and leaving the community paralyzed. Our Matt Rivers has those details for us tonight. Tonight, with the death toll rising, the new images of the dramatic moment the gunman was stopped. The life and death struggle, a good Samaritan taking on the suspected mass murderer Saturday night. Police say most certainly saving lives in doing so. Brandon Tsai telling us he thought he was going to die as he confronted the gunman. Something came over me. I had this realization that I needed to grab his weapon. I needed to take control of the situation right. or else everybody would die, including me. Tsai lunging at the gunman, grabbing the weapon. So you are struggling with him right here? Yes. I'm struggling with him. He's at, fighting back. I have both hands on the gun. He is trying to fight back. He, he was bashing me in the face, behind my head, getting, getting very physical, trying to do everything he could to get the weapon away from me. 
Tsai then wrestling the weapon out of the gunman's hands. And I'm about where he is. Yes, yeah, so you're about where he was. Okay. And at this moment, I pointed a gun at him and told him, get away. You know, I'm gonna shoot you. Get out, go. He says the suspect rants, setting off the half-day manhunt to find him. Authorities using those security camera images from the second ballroom the suspect went to, the Lai Lai Ballroom in Alhambra, just east of Los Angeles, to help identify that gunman, a 72-year-old Hu Can Tran. Police say it was about 20 minutes before that confrontation with the suspect that he was at that first ballroom, just over two miles away in Monterey Park. Tran opened fire inside the Star Ballroom Dance Studio, his first stop killing at least 11 people, injuring nine more during a Lunar New Year celebration. The horror setting off a massive manhunt. Police tracking down the suspect's white van with a stolen license plate in Torrance, some 30 miles from the shooting scene about 12 hours later. When officers exited their patrol vehicle to contact the occupant, they heard one gunshot coming from within the van. SWAT vehicles blocking the van for hours. Then, with guns drawn, heavily armed officers smashing out the window. Inside, authorities say they found Tran dead of a self-inflicted gunshot wound. Come on with your hands up! And tonight, as authorities search for the motive, new details emerging about the alleged shooter. Authorities searching his home in Himmet. Everybody around here just thought he was just some quiet little guy, you know? Officials revealing Tran visited the Himmet police station twice on January 7th and again on the 9th, making a number of allegations, including accusing his own family of poisoning him. Tran's former tenant and longtime acquaintance who asked that we not name him, telling ABC News Tran was a regular at both dance halls he targeted and didn't have many friends at the studio, saying Tran, quote, distrusted everyone and had a personality of, quote, hate towards people. A senior law enforcement official telling ABC News that authorities are investigating reports that Tran may have been targeting his ex-wife and had a history of anger against her. While back at that second ballroom where the suspect was stopped, Brandon Sai telling us taking that gun away from the suspect and then threatening him with it was a terrifying thing to do. In that moment, I feel like I was gonna shoot another person that I what might cause the death of another human being. It's a very serious thought to think about. Wow, and our thanks to Matt Rivers, of course, for that. Authorities also saying tonight that they found more ammunition at the suspect's home, and they also believe that the suspect was manufacturing homemade firearm suppressors. So we're certainly learning a lot more about this suspect as the story develops. Also, earlier, I spoke with a longtime resident here and a leader here. This is Congresswoman uh, Judy Chu. She spoke about how a community here that has really seen so much violence over the last few years is showing strength and moving forward from here on out. As we start to learn a little bit more about this suspect, we still don't have the motive. But as you said, we know he had a connection to that dance studio. Mm -hmm. But what does it mean to this community when it's happening right here during this time of year as you're celebrating the Lunar New Year and it's someone within the community? It was a horrific uh, shock to see that right after we had this joyous opening mm -hmm. ceremony, of our Lunar New Year festival, where there were thousands of people yep. walking around, tons of elected officials there, only one block away, that hours later, this terribly violent act would occur. Would you agree that, you know, a lot of people in the Asian community as a whole have been on high alert, really, since mm -hmm. 2020. Mm -hmm. And this was the first time this celebration was able to happen even in a couple yes. of years since COVID. How are you reassuring your constituents that, that it is safe. I have great concerns about this. I know this is on everybody's mind, yeah. especially because we've been experiencing anti-Asian hate crimes yeah. and incidents for three years since uh, uh, President Trump called it the China virus and therefore people were blaming Asians for COVID. And so we were hearing so many um, stories of assaults on a daily basis that at a certain point we began to wonder, will I be next? So our feelings were very raw. And to see this kind of violence um, only touched off these feelings once more. Um, but again, as, as we're learning more about this, things are starting to unfold. We're unpacking it. We don't have all the details yet, but this is also garnering national attention. Mm -hmm. You spoke with President Biden. I did. What did he have to say to you? 
Uh, I spoke with both President Biden and uh, Vice President Kamala Harris. President Biden uh, wanted to make sure that he expressed his condolences to the entire community because he knows how this affects the entire community. And specifically, he wants to be able to talk to the victims right. and console them. He is the consoler in chief, and I think it's really important to the community for him to do that. You said right away when this happened, this has been a horrific 24 hours. But you also were trying to tell everybody in this community, you are safe. You were actually encouraging community members, go out, celebrate the new year, mm -hmm. don't be afraid. Yes. Why is that your message? I want to assure people that they are safe. This shooter is not alive. Uh, they have nothing to fear. And this shooter should not be allowed to interfere with our way of life. From the beginning, you said this has been a horrifying 24 hours, but you immediately told people here, don't be afraid, encouraging them to go back out, to be in the community, to partake in their New Year events. Mm -hmm. Why do you feel so strongly about that message, the importance of that message? I felt that this was the most important message to give to them. Uh, it was important for them not to let this shooter disrupt their lives yeah. and disrupt all our lives. Uh, we needed to make sure that they could get back to taking care of their children, uh, going to the businesses that they needed to, uh, that they went to the Lunar New Year celebrations that were already there. And at that time, even when the shooter was not caught yet, um, that they didn't need to uh, refrain from those things unless there was some alert from law enforcement. But now that the shooter is gone, it's especially important for us to be able to go out and do those, those things. Mm -hmm. And it's important for us to be together as well uh, to show that we can work together as a community to heal it. Absolutely. And that's why the vigil that we're having tomorrow is so important. Absolutely. And our thanks to Congresswoman Judy Chu for that. And Lindsay, you heard her talk about that vigil that they're having there tomorrow. She says she does plan on being at that vigil. It'll be one of the first times that this community really does come back together. But also, Lindsay, they say they know the nation is watching and they really appreciate the support that they are receiving from across the nation, really, and across the globe right now. And I'm sure they will really appreciate uh, that support in, in all coming together. Kana Whitworth in California for us. Thanks so much, Kana. We'll, of course, check back with you soon. We're joined now by Monterey Park Mayor Henry Lowe. Mayor, thank you so much for joining us during this difficult time for your community. First, what can you tell us about the state of the investigation into the shooter and, and what may have motivated this attack? So right now, um, the investigation is still trying to determine uh, the motive. Um, and so, you know, we, do, we don't know what the motive is, uh, unfortunately. Uh, uh, you know, what we do know is that this is just a very tragic um, crime incident um, that happened during uh, Lunar Weekend Celebration and our community right now is just devastated and in disbelief about what has happened and why it happened in our community. And Monterey Park occupies a unique place in American history as the first suburb with a majority Asian population. For our viewers, just explain what defines your city and what yes. makes it a unique place, especially for the Asian American community there. Well, you know, the so Monterey Park, um, as you mentioned, um, it has its history, uh, its distinction of being an ethno suburb um, uh, with uh, which has um, attracted people from all over Asia, uh, China, and not just Asia, but also Latin America from different parts of the United States. Um, I mean, in, I mean, in many ways, uh, you know, Mario Park is that melting pot city. Uh, we actually uh, grew up in a community in, in near Mario Park. We unfortunately couldn't afford to live here, um, but uh, to my parents, uh, Mario Park um, embodied uh, in their vision of what the American dream was, and so when. Uh, you know, their son was able to uh, move in, uh, buy a home, and then eventually become a council member. It was, in many ways, uh, their embodiment of the American dream being reached.
Uh, there were a couple of quotes from Monterey Park residents to the Washington Post that grabbed my attention that I, I just wanted to read to you. Uh, one said, quote, when people ask me about Monterey Park, I think about the food, the people, that I can go outside at 12 a.m. and feel safe. Now that's shattered. And another said, uh, before this, I always thought Monterey Park was the safest place in America. Today, I think it's not safe anywhere. Uh, what do you say to those residents who've had their sense of security shattered? It is uh, just tragic that uh, we now join a list of, of communities across the United States uh, that have witnessed a mass shooting. As a community, it's going to take time to heal, uh, uh, although I want to say that uh, during this crisis, our police department, uh, are, they have just uh, been incredible in their leadership. Um, they responded to the first calls within three minutes. Um, and working with uh, the FBI, with uh, uh, ATF, um, the uh, county, uh, sheriff's department, uh, the state office of emergency management services. Uh, I mean, in less than 24 hours, uh, the, uh, the suspect uh, essentially was removed from being able to harm anyone ever again. And so, uh, you know, the people of Monterey Park uh, can take heart that uh, they have a police department um, that is committed to their safety. And sadly, you are not the first mayor to have to help his community recover from a senseless mass shooting. Uh, what do you plan to do in the coming days and weeks in order to help your community come together and, and try to move forward? I know sure. you said you're still well, um, feeling in shock uh, tomorrow, at the moment. Tomorrow, uh, we're going to be having a vigil around 5.30 uh, for the community to come out and to uh, uh, express their mourning, um, to pay the respects, to remember those victims. Um, we've established a, a memorial in front of um, City Hall for people to place flowers. Um, we have a crisis, uh, a, a crisis center at our uh, senior center right now for uh, not just the victims and their families, but for anyone in our community who is grieving, who is in need of uh, counseling and emotional support, uh, to, or just to make sense of what has transpired in our community. Um, and you know, also just here behind us, you know, we we have the dance hall. And early today, I had an opportunity to also, you know, uh, pay my respects and uh, see so many people who have come to remember, uh, uh, you know, those who have tragically died, and also to remember, you know, this place was a place of of um, uh, dancing, of socializing, um, and uh, unfortunately, uh, it, it, that have all been shattered. We understand that. All right, Monterey Park Mayor Henry Lowe, we thank you so much for your time tonight. Our, our thoughts are certainly with your entire community tonight. Thank you so very much. For more now, let's bring in retired ATF Specialist Agent Scott Sweeto. Uh, thank you so much for your time tonight. Uh, the ATF is playing a big role in the investigation right now. I understand that the ATF's gun tracing program helped ultimately identify the gun and the shooter. Talk to us about what happens when the ATF needs to run a quick trace on a gun. It's really all about crime gun intelligence and following the gun. So under a circumstance like this where you've got a, a mass killing ATF would do what's called an urgent trace, which is getting agents to gather the information up from the firearm, preferably by looking at it directly and getting that to our facility in Martinsburg, West Virginia, so that we can have people go and, and look through the records and figure out who the last purchaser of that firearm likely was. Uh, federal agents can run quick scans on things like license plates and fingerprints, but a decades-old law has prevented a searchable digital database of gun transaction records. I imagine this has a pretty major impact when gun ownership needs to be traced quickly. Uh, it, it's, a, it's a significant issue. There are literally hundreds of contractors sitting in Martinsburg, Virginia right now as we're speaking. They're going about the business of doing both routine and urgent traces. The records are literally piled up, uh, in some cases, in metal shipping containers sitting out in the parking lot waiting to be digitally scanned. But unlike what you and I could easily do on our computer, by digitizing that so that it's searchable, ATF has been forbidden for decades from creating a searchable database, which means that they have to go through in a very cumbersome process by hand and under the best circumstances, that can take many, many hours. 
And so I understand the, the gentleman, Mr. Say, who was at that second location, who was able to, to wrestle the gun away from the shooter, was it that physical gun that you were then able to search a serial number on it, for example, leading you back to the shooter? Yes, that's exactly what happens, is someone has to look at it, make sure that we can identify the firearm correctly with the make, model, and serial number, and then trace it. Uh, and in California, there's an added uh, possibility because California has its own very advanced record keeping system. So that was another avenue that the agents and investigators would have been able to look at in the hours after this killing. Uh, the gun the shooter used is banned in California. How was he able to get the weapon or do we know that yet? So that's something that uh, I imagine investigators from Monterey Park, the Sheriff's Department, certainly my old agency, ATF, are looking at. There are processes where he could possibly have bought that gun before it was banned and registered the thing in a, in a grandfathering process, but that's not very likely. And I think in the coming hours and days, agents are really gonna be trying to pour over those records and find out how did he how did he get the gun? Did something slip through the cracks? And, and is there anything that could be fixed? How can the ATF effectively enforce gun laws when the patchwork of laws is just so different depending on which state you're talking about? Um, it is a tough job being an ATF agent. I, I was one for 30 years, and you really are dealing with 50 different states who have a, a, a crazy quilt of ideas about what should be done. And then you have all the federal laws, and the federal laws are really subject to what the United States attorney in each of these judicial districts wants to do. If they don't want to prosecute gun crimes uh, as an ATF agent, the only recourse you have is sometimes going to the state. So it, it really is something I think that could be improved. All right, Scott Sweeto, right. we thank you so much for your time. Really appreciate your insight. Thank you, Lindsay. Now to another deadly shooting, this time in Des Moines, Iowa, at a charter school where two students were killed and a staff member was wounded. Our Alex Perez joins us now. Alex, what do we know about what unfolded there? Well, Lindsay, some unbelievably terrifying moments for parents in Des Moines this afternoon. Now, panicked loved ones rushing to the educational facility in downtown Des Moines as word of the shooting spread. Authorities say two high school age students are dead and an adult staff member remains hospitalized after a shooting inside the facility just before one o'clock this afternoon. Police call the incident targeted and not random. The Starts Right Here program is aimed at young people with behavioral or other issues issues not enrolled in traditional schools. Now, Lindsay, three suspects are in custody. Authorities say an exact motive remains unclear. Lindsay? All right. Alex Perez for us. Thanks so much, Alex. We will continue to report from Monterey Park with Kena Whitworth on the ground there. But after the break, more of the leading stories across the country, including the discoveries FBI agents found during an unprecedented 13-hour raid of President Biden's Delaware home. Plus, the verdict is in for the founder of the militia group who participated in the attack on our nation's capital. And Swifties, stand by as we tell you who to expect at the Senate hearing of the Ticketmaster meltdown that sent the Internet into a frenzy. Get ready, America, every Friday. The hottest trends, styles, and must-have. What's the right stuff to buy right now? I really love that. It's time to buy the right stuff. Yes. And save big time, too. The right stuff. Fridays on GMA. You're going to love it. Bring your friends. Bring them all. If only there was a place in the morning to start my day. With a smile, somewhere to help me get in the know. A place as spectacular as, well, me. Hmm, I think we might know a place, right, guys? Bring your friends. Oh, wait, there is. Good morning, America. GMA, 7A, every day. Boom. 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 Good morning, Michael. Good morning, Robin. Good morning, America. How are you? Boom. Now that's how you start your day, people. With so much happening these days, it's hard to keep up. Things change hour by hour, minute by minute. The historic weather that's now unfolding. The worries on Wall Street. We're bringing you the right now. Been a nationwide teacher shortage. The right now look at the day ahead. An alert this morning for dog owners and the key takeaways from the biggest stories. World News Now and America This Morning, America's number one early morning news. Today does feel a little different. Early mornings on ABC News Live. 
so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. So, what's good to read? And we mean really good to read right now. Well, that's where Charlie and Kate Gibson can help. Join us for the new podcast series. It is called The Bookcase with Kate and Charlie. We will make sure you love what you read. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. Come on, y'all. Make some noise. I'm hurt, Janine. Janine. Gregory. Um, Ava. Ava's here. Sorry, I don't speak lines. This is ABC News Live Prime. Hey there, I'm Lindsay Davis. Thanks so much for streaming with us. Live reporting, breaking news, exclusives, award-winning, powerful, eye-opening. How lucky are we? ABC News Live Prime with Lindsay Davis. All new, streaming weeknights. Reporting from New York, I'm Monaco Sarabdi. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Now to the major developments in Washington where President Biden is under fire after an unprecedented 13-hour FBI search at his Delaware home over the weekend, which uncovered a fourth batch of classified documents, with some of them dating as far back as the president's time as a senator. That's leaving even some of the president's supporters expressing alarm. ABC senior White House correspondent Mary Bruce has the latest. President Biden arriving back in Washington today after the White House revealed the FBI discovered new classified documents during their unprecedented search of his Delaware home. Mr. President, did you know those documents were there, sir? Were you irresponsible, Mr. President? The White House insists they offered to let the FBI conduct the search. Agents arrived at 9.45 Friday morning and for nearly 13 hours scoured all working, living, and storage spaces of the home. The White House tonight won't say exactly how much classified material was found, just that it was six items consisting of documents with classification markings, some from his time as vice president, others going all the way back to his years in the Senate. It comes roughly six months after FBI agents armed with a warrant retrieved more than 100 classified documents from the Mar-a-Lago home of former President Donald Trump after he refused for months to cooperate. The attorney general today pressed on whether Trump was treated more harshly than Biden. The department has a set of norms and practices. We do not have different rules for Democrats or Republicans, different rules for the powerful or the powerless. Biden has insisted he's done everything by the book. There's no there there. The president says he takes the handling of classified material seriously. We continue to learn about more documents being found and discovered at his home, including now some that go back decades to his time in the Senate. So why should the American people believe that this president takes classified material seriously and the handling of it? He was very clear what, with, with the response of what we're currently seeing. And he says, I take this very seriously. He said, I didn't know uh, that the documents were there. He just said the president said that he did not know the documents were there. I'm not actually sure he has said that that clearly. Are you saying the president did well, he not know he was surprised. He said he was surprised. So they're saying that he was not expecting them to find documents there. Mary Bruce joins us now from the White House. Mary, uh, the White House says that they've offered to have the FBI search the president's Wilmington home. But, but what about his beach house? Could there be a search for documents there as well? Well, Lindsay, tonight they are not ruling out the possibility that the FBI could also search the president's beach house in Delaware or that they could take another look at the president's former private office here in Washington. And we also circle back on that other question. And the White House counsel spokesman isn't giving a definitive answer on whether the president was surprised or knew any of those documents were there. Lindsay. Well, Mary Bruce from the White House for us. Thanks so much, Mary. Thank you. A former top FBI official is under arrest tonight over his suspected ties to a Russian oligarch. Charles McGonagall, who formerly served as the counterintelligence chief and retired from the FBI in 2018, he's been charged with money laundering and is accused of trying to get sanctions against a Russian billionaire dropped. McGonagall is one of the highest ranking FBI officials ever charged with a crime. He has pleaded not guilty. 
Tonight, four Oath Keepers have been convicted of seditious conspiracy and plotting to prevent Joe Biden from becoming president so Donald Trump could remain in office. Today, a Washington, D.C. jury handed down the guilty verdict. Among the guilty, Edward Vallejo, who the jury was able to identify at a hotel in Virginia with a supply of assault rifles. This is the second time in recent weeks that a jury has decided that the violence on January 6th was the product of a premeditated, organized conspiracy, not a spontaneous event. Now to Memphis, where the family of 29-year-old Tyree Nichols is reacting after personally seeing video of the encounter with police that put him in the hospital. He died three days later. After the police department saw that video, all five officers were fired. But will the public get a chance to see it for themselves? Our senior national correspondent Steve Osinsami reports. The parents of Tyree Nichols say that what they watched today was so difficult to see, his mother had to close her eyes and walk away. What I saw on the video today was horrific. All my son was trying to do was get home. After weeks of demanding to see what police body cameras recorded, to see what happened to their son, authorities pulled them into an office and shared multiple videos from what started as a traffic stop on January 7th and somehow led to this. He died three days after the incident. Today, his family says they saw police officers kick, pepper spray, and use a stun gun on their 29-year-old son while he asked them, what did I do? Was there a point where he told them that he could or could not breathe? You could see it, but you didn't hear him say it. You could see him struggling. It was clear that he was struggling. Police say they pulled him over for alleged reckless driving and that he ran, but his family says it's clear in the video that the response from officers was excessive. And on that point, Memphis police agree. They have fired all five officers and they are all the subject of both a state and now federal investigation. The family says the fact that the officers are all African-American doesn't change anything. I hate that it was black police officers that did this to my son. It doesn't matter if the cop is black or white. What we want to see is that they treat our children with the same dignity and respect that they treat everybody else. Our thanks to Steve Osinsami. Bowling Green State University has settled a hazing lawsuit for nearly $3 million. A family of Stone Folds agreed to the deal. He died of alcohol poisoning while pledging Pi Kappa Alpha in March of last year. New members were told to finish a bottle of alcohol. Eight former members were found guilty of various charges, including reckless homicide and hazing. It was the fan meltdown heard around the world. Ticketmaster's massive site crashed during the fan pre-sale for Taylor Swift's uh, Eras Tour, sent Swifties into a frenzy, and it sent Senate into action. Now the ticketing giant is the focus of a series of Senate hearings that start tomorrow. That will put the company's CFO in the hot seat. Our Mona Kosar Abdi looks at how we got here and what to expect. <gasps> From the anticipation. I finally get to tell you, I'm going back on tour. To the excitement. <laughs> Taylor Swift ticket update. I got him. <laughs> Are you joking? What? To the meltdown. The tickets you have selected have been released. <laughs> the line has stopped moving. The website fully crashed. I waited in line. <laughs> for like six hours. It's now the infamous Ticketmaster crash during the pre-sale of Taylor Swift's upcoming stadium tour. The disaster last November left millions of fans not feeling all too well. With no shortage of bad blood, the ticketing giant is facing scrutiny from not just Swifties, but senators too. I talked to Senator Mike Lee last night. We chair the committee on antitrust. We are going to go ahead with a hearing on Ticketmaster um, this year. The Senate Judiciary Committee will host the hearing titled That's the Ticket, promoting competition and protecting consumers in live entertainment is set for Tuesday. Under the microscope, Ticketmaster's apparent hold on the industry. Ticketmaster currently controls more than 70% of the market for ticketing and live events. Antitrust Chair Senator Klobuchar explained in a statement that the committee will, quote, examine how consolidation in the live entertainment and ticketing industries harms customers and artists alike. Amy Klobuchar, a Democratic senator, has a long history of uh, antitrust mobilization, and this is something that, they're, that she has been interested in for quite some time now. Jem Aswan, deputy music editor for Variety, says the issue may be far more complex than it appears. 
Ticketing is so complicated and so deep that you do wonder how much anyone can really get into the weeds on it, but I think that's what we're going to find out. The committee's witnesses include Joe Birchtold, president and CFO of Live Nation Entertainment, which owns Ticketmaster, and the CEO of SeatGeek, one of Ticketmaster's biggest competitors. This won't be the first time the company has been in the hot seat. Back in 1994, Ticketmaster found themselves in front of a congressional committee amid accusations they were operating as a monopoly, a claim they denied. The monopoly issues have been going on for years and years and years and years. Pearl Jam took them before Congress. It just didn't, doesn't seem fair to us the way a lot of things are done in the music industry. And Pearl Jam tried to do a tour without Ticketmaster, couldn't, gave up. Since then, the company has only tightened its grip on the industry. Ticketmaster has been further expanding, merging with Live Nation. How are they allowed to do that? How is an interesting question, you know? I mean, there are always, with the way, of course, with the ways that laws work, people find ways around them. They own a lot of the entities that are involved, and that gives them an awful lot of muscle. Ticketmaster's parent company, Live Nation, defended itself in a November 19 statement, saying Live Nation takes its responsibilities under the antitrust laws seriously and does not engage in behaviors that would require it to alter fundamental business practices. They also said it has a significant share of the primary ticketing services market because of the large gap that exists between the quality of the Ticketmaster system and the next best primary ticketing system. The company has pointed to the level of demand for Swift's Eras Tour as a major factor in the crash, claiming that their website saw over 3.5 billion requests, overwhelming the system. To use a metaphor, you had like 50,000 people trying to get through a door that would let 500 people through, basically. So what do you do about that? Many Swift fans were left frustrated, disappointed with no answers. This broke a trust because it broke not just a trust between Ticketmaster and her, it hurt a lot of her fans. You can't look at Taylor and, and say that she's just the artist, she doesn't have control. She is Taylor the businesswoman, she's Taylor the corporation. In the days after the meltdown, Swift said in a statement, quote, it's really difficult for me to trust an outside entity with these relationships and loyalties and excruciating for me to just watch mistakes happen with no recourse. There are a multitude of reasons why people had such a hard time trying to get tickets and I'm trying to figure out how this situation can be improved moving forward. As the hearings unfold, Aswan says he isn't optimistic that there will be any significant changes in the near future. There's no one who even comes close to Ticketmaster's strength, its reach, its muscle, its ability to sell the volume of tickets that it has to. You're talking about millions and millions and millions of tickets, and nobody else can do that right now. Um, and it would be years before anyone could. And other eager fan bases awaiting the announcement and ticket rollouts for highly anticipated tours hope they don't have to face the same crash. Beyonce hasn't toured for six years, seven years, and there's going to be an equal enormous demand, and we'll see how much they've learned from it. What I do know is Ticketmaster or whomever else has to figure out how to solve this before Beyonce announces her tour. Because if you think the Swifties are bad, the Beehive, you don't want to mess with the behind. Ticketmaster, get ready. Our thanks to Mona for that. Still ahead here on Prime, we continue with our coverage on the shooting in Monterey Park and the ripple effects on the community. And we sit down with Georgia Senator Raphael Warnock to discuss his new book and the important lesson he learned from his own father. And the latest big tech company to announce they are laying off hundreds. We'll tell you why. at stake. So much on the line. More Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News World News Tonight with David Muir. America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. This is where I belong. This is home. Real dirt in the sunlight again. I'm very excited. Anything could happen at any moment. My heart is so happy right now. We're making magic. We're making magic. magic.
With so much at stake in our world right now, we wanted to thank you for your trust and for making ABC News America's number one news. And thank you for making ABC News Live America's number one streaming news. Zoo! 200! Oh, 200! 200 episodes of Dr. Pole. Oh. Music to my ears. It's been 10 years, and I'm still having the fun. That rocks. He's got the moves that make your animals groove. Now we do the dance of joy. Yay. He's like the Justin Bieber of the <laughs> Headlining the hottest barns. Shut out. It's a show you won't want to miss. I'm not going to be here forever. Maybe. <laughs> the Incredible Dr. Pole. New episodes Saturdays at 9 on Nat Geo Wild. This is ABC News Live Prime. Thanks so much for streaming with us. Live reporting, breaking news, exclusives, award-winning, powerful, eye-opening. ABC News Live Prime with Lindsay Davis. Streaming weeknights. So, what's good to read? And we mean really good to read right now. Well, that's where Charlie and Kate Gibson can help. Join us for the new podcast series. It is called The Bookcase with Kate and Charlie. We will make sure you love what you read. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. I'm innocent. I am innocent. I am innocent. How annoying that you just said all this innocent stuff for so long and you're really guilty. She would throw things. <laughs> it was like working with a 40 year old child. The housewife scam, the real life of the Jen Shaw. Money. Six and a half years in federal prison. Jen Shaw, a fraud. This is Impact by Nightline, now streaming on Hulu. Reporting from Denver, I'm Mola Lenghi. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Welcome back. A community already facing a rise in threats. The Asian American community has been shaken by the mass shooting in Monterey Park, California. And it's especially difficult coming on the Lunar New Year, the biggest celebration of the year. Nightline co-anchor Juju Chang has more. Tonight, we're learning more about the lives lost at the Star Ballroom Dance Studio. 63-year-old Lillian Lee. 65-year-old Mei Mei Nan, killed as she was pulling out of the dance studio parking lot. Her niece telling us Mei Mei's dance partner of more than a decade by her side. And so this is her dance partner. This is her dance partner. Who's in the passenger seat. Yes. And witnesses it all. Yeah. The shooter came um, from the driver's side window, shot in, and... Um, he wasn't wearing any face covering or anything, um, so my aunt's partner saw um, who he was, um, didn't recognize him at all. That dance partner unharmed, but Mei Mei had been shot in the head multiple times. He saw the wound on her head. He tried to cover it with his hands to stop the bleeding, um, but you know he, he said she wasn't responsive the entire time. When the gunfire erupted inside the ballroom, there were still dozens of people gathered for a special Lunar New Year party. That dancer Shally's partner dying in her arms. Just in my heart, I was thinking I see him all the time. From now on, I cannot see him tomorrow. It was, uh, you were thinking, you see this person just uh, yesterday, and then from now on, you don't see him no more. The rampage shattering Monterey Park, known as the first suburban Chinatown, just as families were celebrating the first in-person lunar festival in three years. People were lying on the ground with their dance shoes on. You know, people were wearing their beautiful dance shoes out for a night of festivities, never expecting something like this to happen in what's supposed to be the happiest time for the Chinese community. And for years, this studio, a gathering place for people bonding over a shared love of music and elegant dance seen here in this Facebook video. When I think of her, um, I think, I hope a takeaway for everyone is just be kind, care for people. Um, you don't know what their backstory is. Um, sometimes a smile, sometimes, you know, kind words can make their day. And that's how she lived her life. All about that kindness. And Juju Chang joins us now from Monterey Park. Juju, uh, this community, as we've been talking about, predominantly made up of Chinese Americans. How are they handling this attack on, on what is such a special time of celebration? 
Well, it's bittersweet, you can imagine, and it runs the gamut. On one hand, you have people who are fearful. There are others that say we need to continue to celebrate. But, you know, Monterey Park, like Asians across the country, were celebrating. They were dressing up in costumes. Asian Americans like to have traditional noodles and dumplings on the Lunar New Year. And they also like to pray for their ancestors. So, you know, I asked Fonda, what special prayer would you have for your aunt, given that she's now joined her ancestors? And you know what she said back, Lindsay, was simply keep dancing spark mm. that joy Lindsay wow. all right so moving and meaningful Juju Chang our thanks to you for your reporting all day and it's that dance studio that sense of belonging within that dance community that we're thinking about tonight it's a place that has been turned upside down and one we hope can become a place of belonging once again we welcome back Kena Whitworth who joins us again from Monterey Park California Kena uh, you were able to talk to someone who survived the shooting tell us about that yeah, Lindsay, it's unbelievable to hear some of these stories. Earlier today, I met with Hyung Bang, and he was actually at the dance hall that night, and he returned to this parking lot today. He was here to get his car. And you couldn't tell at first, but he was wearing a bandage on his leg. He was actually shot that night. But how he sees it is the bullet went through his leg, but saved his life. You said you had been dancing for about two hours. Yeah. And you went in to use the restroom. Yeah, right. What happened next? And when I get out from the restroom, the, the shooting already stopped. First, like a pound, 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 pound. About, I think maybe about 10 rounds. You thought it was a firecracker? Yeah, people celebrate. And then, and then the guns, about 20 to 30 rounds. It got faster, yeah, faster. more rapid. Yeah, automatic. <laughs> You felt pain in your leg, but yeah. had no idea you had even been shot. Yeah. I ran back to Rick's room to check, to check my, my leg. I, I, I saw that's a, a hole just like this, but, wow. but not too much bleeding. Get shot, I, I, I went back to Rick's room, but when I get out, I come outside, the only, the only already, already died. And then, then, and then I try to to come outside a little bit more. At my at my right hand side, there's there are three ladies already died. At left hand side, one more lady, and the other I I, I don't know because I'm so nervous. I just go to take looking for my dancing partner and take her back and, and just run outside. I'm lucky. Maybe I can say. That bully hurt my, my leg, saved my life. Because if, if I, I didn't get, get shot, maybe I, I go to the front, the, the bully, the, the killer still there, maybe he, he killed me. Wow, isn't that so hard to hear? He told me that the first thing he did when he was able to leave was he ran into this parking lot to find his dance partner, and he was able to find his dance partner. He said that was so happy, and you can tell in our interview, Lindsay, his, the side of his jacket there was cut because the paramedics had to come, and they had to cut off his jacket right away to try to take his blood pressure, and he has it sort of all pinned together today. He was still wearing his dance shoes, uh, but, Lindsay, he said, despite all of that, and while he is strong, he's like, I don't know if I'm gonna be able to dance again. And, and, and we are hearing that from some people. It's just hit so close to home, Lindsay. Well, we certainly hope he will be putting those dance shoes back to use sooner than yeah. later. Kana, thank you. Still ahead, we sat down with Georgia's first black senator to discuss the latest shooting, parenthood, and a lot more. And it is something I've thought about as a father, as a, as a black father. You wanna shield your children from that part of the world that's inimical to their humanity, but you do know that the day will come when they confront these things. I'm innocent. I am innocent. I am innocent. How annoying that you just said all this innocent stuff for so long and you're really guilty. She would throw things. <laughs> it was like working with a 40 year old child. The housewife scam, the real life of the Jen Shaw. Money. Six and a half years in federal prison. Jen Shaw. A fraud. This is Impact by Nightline, now streaming on Hulu. Get ready, America, every Friday. The hottest trends, styles, and must-have. What's the right stuff to buy right now? 
Oh, I really love that. It's time to buy the right stuff. Yes. And save big time, too. The right stuff. Fridays on GMA. You're going to love it. Now streaming on ABC News Live 2020. True crime, cinematic, real life drama, stunning, the unthinkable. Follow the clues, the hunt, true crime 2020. Now streaming on ABC News Live. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? <laughs> Can I hug you? Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 12 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. He is a preacher and a senator, also a father, and now a children's book author. I had the chance to sit down with Senator Raphael Warnock to discuss our nation's gun problem and the lessons behind waking up early, putting your shoes on, and getting ready. Thank you so much for talking with us. Love the books. Thanks. Before we get to the book, if we can, you know, obviously we've been talking about this latest massacre that happened over the weekend in Monterey Park in California. We're just in the third week of January, you already have had 32 other mass shootings in the country. Uh, with the divided house, do you think there's any chance for some kind of gun control to, to be able to come through or any kind of reform? Well, first of all, let me say that my heart goes out to the families of the victims. You know, it's tragic that this has become a part of the landscape of American life. I'm afraid that that we wince in some sense and then we move on. But we should never become acclimated to this kind of tragedy. Uh, so my heart goes out to those families. We've got to do everything we can to make sure that this does not keep happening. We did pass bipartisan gun safety legislation last summer in the Congress. It was the first thing that got passed in 30 years. It took way too long. And so I, I do remain hopeful that we can find ways to get something done. Look. What, what we need is for the Congress to finally get where the American people are. Politicians need to learn how to center the people rather than their own short-term political interests. And if you do that, you can get something done. And just one more on that, and then we'll get right to the book. In addition to the prayers and condolences that we hear so often, what would be your first priority when it comes to some kind of gun control? Well, uh, again, we did get some legislation passed uh, last summer. Uh, I'd like to sit down with the folks who were at the table as we got that done last summer and begin to talk about what are the things that we can agree on and get done in this moment. I want to talk about the book now. Put your shoes on and get ready. Your dad was 93 when he passed away in 2010. What would he make of you writing a book? It's about you, but really a lot about him. Yeah, my dad was my hero. And, uh, you know, I had an older father, a World War II veteran. 52 years old when I was born, and uh, he poured a lot into me. And the title of the book, Put Your Shoes On and Get Ready, that's literally what he told me every single day. Seven days a week, rain or shine, you didn't walk around barefoot, you put your shoes on and you got ready for the job, whatever it was. One day he woke me up and said, you know, get ready. And I said, get ready for what? And I think I stumped him. He said, I, I, I'll tell you later, just get ready. And that was his, his he had a fierce work ethic. It inspires me to this day. His life, uh, a black man born in 1917, who, as I talk about in the book, en endured his own challenges, never lost hope. He knew that there was a place in the world for him, and that's, what this, that's the message of this book for all children. Whoever you are, wherever you come from, uh, there are shoes that fit your feet, and there's a job for you to do. And you talk about his life and, and living in a, a segregated world growing up, and you do that in a way that's, I think, very easy to understand for children. How much of a, a tightrope did you have to walk to, to get that kind of message in that was age appropriate? Well, I have two little ones at home of my own. I have a six-year-old daughter, Chloe, and my four-year-old son, Caleb. They're also in the book, and uh, I read it to them a couple weeks ago. They didn't know I was writing a book. They certainly didn't know they were in a book. And so I had a lot of fun sitting there reading it to my own children. And it is something I've thought about as a father, as a, as a black father. You want to shield your children from that part of the world that's inimical to their humanity, but you do know that the day will come when they confront these things. 
And so I think the care and the concern in how this is related uh, comes through my own lens as a, as a dad. What do you tell your six and four year old when they get up now? Put your shoes on and get ready? <laughs> I do. I, I have to laugh because literally I'm running around the house and I'm getting them dressed in the mornings and I hear myself sounding like my dad. Put your shoes on, where are your shoes? And um, you know, very often uh, they would rather put on my shoes. And so- As you did. As I did. And I was maybe taking a little bit of a liberty, but from the Bible, when you have David, who King Saul had given him his armor, right? right. But he said it was too big for him. It wasn't fit for him, and so he had to, to take it off. And in the book you write, while I give sermons like my father and preach from the same pulpit as Dr. King, I never thought it was my job to walk in either of their shoes. I must wear my own shoes, shoes that fit my feet. I have to do the job that I was meant to do. What is the job now as you as you see it, your job? Well, first of all, I've served as pastor of Ebenezer Church where Dr. King preached for the last now nearly 18 years. I, I still serve in that pulpit, but I also now have the high honor of representing the people of Georgia in the United States Senate. It is a real honor when the people of your state say, when we think about our families, when we think about our children and our hopes and our dreams for our children, as we try to take care of our aging parents as they deal with both the blessing and the burdens of getting older, we trust you. We want you to go down to that crazy town called Washington and do your best for us. That is the high honor of my life and I try my best to live up to that promise every single day. My life's project is service and my work in the Senate is just the latest chapter. What would you like kids who read this book to, to take away from it? You know, I think about a quote from someone who's inspired me named Howard Thurman. He was a Christian mystic graduate of Morehouse College. He said, ask not what the world needs, ask what makes you come alive. Because what the world needs is people who have come alive. And so putting on your own shoes is my way of saying that. Um, in a way that I think children can get it. Lastly, uh, if President Biden decides to run again, will you support him? Oh, I, I will. And uh, I think he's going to run again, but uh, I, I'm gonna remain focused on the people of Georgia. No matter uh, who's running for president, my job is to do the job that the people of Georgia hired me to do, which is why I'm focused on expanding health care for the 600,000 Georgians who are in the health care coverage gap. Uh, I want to continue to do what I can to make sure young people have access to a quality education and that they're not burdened with debt as a result of it. And I want to create jobs and opportunity all across our state. In some sharp shoes there. <laughs> You're kind. <laughs> all right, thank you. All the best with the book. Thank you. Thank Good you, to be with you. you. Before we go tonight, as we hit the one hour mark in our programming, a reminder that statistics indicate that in that span of 60 minutes, at least four people lose their lives at the hands of a gun in this country. By the end of the night, that number rises to 111. Whether it's Monterey Park, Des Moines, or any other place in this country, it is an increasingly intensifying truth that is unique to this particular country. And so we conclude this hour with tonight's image of the day, a scene that regularly plays out on America's sidewalks, flowers and candles lining memorial, this time for the mass shooting victims at the Star Ballroom Dance Studio in Monterey Park, California. And that is our show for this hour. Be sure to stay tuned to ABC News Live for more context and analysis of the day's top stories. Thanks so much for streaming with us. staying on top of a few things, we return to Monterey Park, where Kenna Whitworth is on the ground with the latest on the deadly Lunar New Year attack and how the community is trying to come together to heal. With so much at stake in our world right now, we wanted to thank you for your trust and for making ABC News America's number one news. And thank you for making ABC News Live America's number one streaming news. After an extraordinary newsmaking year, thank you for making ABC's This Week America's number one news and politics show on Sunday mornings. You never know what you're going to get on this show. That's all I'm going to tell you. Yes, Whoopi! This mic on? Can you hear me out there?
work. Behind the scenes is always a better show. Absolutely. Always. Absolutely. That's what people don't see during the commercial break. Right. They don't. What happened? I had no idea really what I was getting myself into. That day that we walked out, I, I treasure that day. I just, I couldn't sit there. You're doing good, Joy. You're doing good. Oh, yeah, baby. It was crazy. Behind the table. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. From America's number one news source comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and it can customize to you and your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience what all the buzz is about. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. We're honored. ABC's 2020 winner of three Emmy Awards for Excellence. Thank you for making 2020 Friday night's most watched and most honored news magazine. This is ABC News Live Prime. Hey there, I'm Lindsay Davis. Thanks so much for streaming with us. Live reporting, breaking news, exclusives, award-winning, powerful, eye-opening. How lucky are we? ABC News Live Prime with Lindsay Davis. All new, streaming weeknights. Reporting in Buffalo, I'm Trevor Alt. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Good evening, everyone. I'm Lindsay Davis. Thank you so much for streaming with us as we enter the year of the rabbit, a symbol long associated with peace. Tonight, that peace has been shattered for a grieving city in Southern California and beyond. An Asian American community left shell shocked after yet another mass shooting. This one taking place during a celebration of the Lunar New Year, one of the most important celebrations of the year for East and Southeast Asian cultures. And as we come on the air, we are also learning about another deadly shooting at a school in Iowa that's left multiple people dead. More on that in a moment. But we begin with the wounds still fresh from the horrific shooting in Monterey Park Saturday night. At least 11 people are dead nine others injured after a shooter opened fire inside a dance studio. Most of the victims are in their 60s. And it could have been even worse if a 26-year-old man had not wrestled the semi-automatic gun from the suspected shooter's hand at a second dance studio where he visited. Tonight, many are wondering why Monterey Park and if any warning signs may have been missed. Let's bring in Arcana Whitworth once again, who's been on the ground in Monterey Park, where a grieving community is still struggling to, to try to make sense of it all. Hey, Kana. Right, Lindsay, and how do you do that, right? How do you make sense of this? Here in Monterey Park, I will say that people are showing a tremendous amount of resilience. You can actually see behind me a memorial here is growing. But the fear is not in this community. We are already hearing vows to return to the dance hall and continue to support its success and make sure that it's here for future generations. And we don't know the motive of this attack, but we do know the suspect had ties to this dance studio. We've also learned tonight from authorities that one victim was found outside the dance hall and in their vehicle. Authorities were on scene here within minutes. They immediately called for reinforcements. Also tonight, the L.A. County supervisor is saying that this is the worst mass shooting in L.A. County history. And it could have been much worse. Authorities say that gunman tried entering yet a second dance hall just a few minutes from here. They say he had a modified semi-automatic weapon with an extended magazine. But it was a hero that wrestled it away, likely, likely saving hundreds of lives. After that, the gunman left that second dance hall and led the SWAT team on a massive manhunt while this community waited on edge. Our Matt Rivers has those details for us tonight. Tonight, with the death toll rising, the new images of the dramatic moment the gunman was stopped. The life and death struggle, a good Samaritan taking on the suspected mass murderer Saturday night. Police say most certainly saving lives in doing so. Brandon Sy telling us he thought he was going to die as he confronted the gunman. Something came over me. I had this realization that I needed to grab his weapon. I needed to take control of the situation right. or else everybody would die, including me. Tsai lunging at the gunman, grabbing the weapon. So you are struggling with him right here? Yes. I'm struggling with him. He's at, fighting back. At both hands on the gun. He is trying to fight back. He, he was bashing me in the face, behind my head, getting, getting very physical, trying to do everything he could to get the weapon away from me. Tsai then wrestling the weapon out of the gunman's hands. And I'm about where he is? Yes, you're about where he was. Okay. And at this moment, I pointed a gun at him and told him, get away. You know, I'm going to shoot you. Get out. Go. 
He says the suspect ran, setting off the half-day manhunt to find him. Authorities using those security camera images from the second ballroom the suspect went to, the Lai Lai Ballroom in Alhambra, just east of Los Angeles, to help identify that gunman, a 72-year-old Hu Can Tran. Police say it was about 20 minutes before that confrontation with the suspect that he was at that first ballroom, just over two miles away in Monterey Park. Tran opened fire inside the Star Ballroom Dance Studio, his first stop killing at least 11 people, injuring nine more during a Lunar New Year celebration. The horror setting off a massive manhunt. Police tracking down the suspect's white van with a stolen license plate in Torrance, some 30 miles from the shooting scene, about 12 hours later. When officers exited their patrol vehicle to contact the occupant, they heard one gunshot coming from within the van. SWAT vehicles blocking the van for hours. Then, with guns drawn, heavily armed officers smashing out the window. Inside, authorities say they found Tran dead of a self-inflicted gunshot wound. Come out with your hands up! And tonight, as authorities search for the motive, new details emerging about the alleged shooter. Authorities searching his home in Himmet. Everybody around here just thought he was just some quiet little guy, you know? Officials revealing Tran visited the Himmet police station twice on January 7th and again on the 9th, making a number of allegations, including accusing his own family of poisoning him. Tran's former tenant and longtime acquaintance who asked that we not name him, telling ABC News Tran was a regular at both dance halls he targeted and didn't have many friends at the studio, saying Tran, quote, distrusted everyone and had a personality of, quote, hate towards people. A senior law enforcement official telling ABC News that authorities are investigating reports that Tran may have been targeting his ex-wife and had a history of anger against her. While back at that second ballroom where the suspect was stopped, Brandon Sy telling us taking that gun away from the suspect and then threatening him with it was a terrifying thing to do. In that moment, I feel like I was going to shoot another person that I what might cause the death of another human being is very th serious thought to think about. Such quick action and quick thinking by that young man. Our thanks to Matt Rivers for that report. Also, authorities saying tonight they found more ammo during their search, and they also say the suspect was manufacturing homemade firearm suppressors. Now, also tonight, I spoke with Elizabeth Yang. You now, she owns a law firm here. It's actually directly across the street from this dance hall, and she herself goes to this dance hall with her young daughter. Her mother has gone there for years. And she says not only is it an integral part of the dance community, but the entire community as a whole. And while the loss is profound, she says they're already banding together, vowing to support this dance hall and secure its future here in Monterey Park. You're a huge part of this community. Tell me what it was like on this New Year's Eve. Were you down here with your family celebrating? I was um, at home with my family celebrating Lunar New Year's Eve. We were in our festive costumes, eating all the foods that we're supposed to eat on Lunar, Lunar New Year's Eve, exchanging red envelopes. The children were giving the elderly folks blessings. It was a very joyous and celebratory occasion. And you were looking forward to New Year's Day as it was. Yeah, New Year's Eve is the start of a 15-day celebration of New Year's Day. It's not just a one-day event, it's a two-week event. And we were looking forward to another full day of festivities on Sunday with the Learning New Year Festival, with other meals and gatherings, which ended up to be all canceled. And as the news of this shooting broke, and you start to realize not only did it happen across the street from your office, but it happened at a dance studio in which your mother used to dance at, you and your daughter have even danced at together. What was that like for the family as the news started to come in? Um, I didn't want to accept the reality of what was going on. I was hoping that, um, because that, uh, on Saturday night, we weren't sure the exact location right. of the shooting. It's, they said 122 West Garvey, but there's multiple suites for 122. So I was praying that it wouldn't be the dance studio. And as news started unfolding that it was the dance studio, I, I was praying that it wouldn't be members of the community that I knew of. And um, we have a WeChat group for the dance studio uh -huh. members. We were just starting to message each other on WeChat, checking in, are you okay? Did you did you guys hear about the shooting? Were you in the shooting? Just making sure everyone was okay. 
and you come to realize that the owner was killed. This is a someone. This is someone who you said your mother knew really well. Yeah, Instructor Ma has been part of this ballroom dancing community for decades. He's an integral part of the community. My mom danced years ago um, when she was younger, and she knew Instructor Ma, and she's devastated to find out that he passed away yesterday. Um, I remember coming into the dance studio. He would always be at the front desk welcoming people with a smile on his face. And as this community is dealing with this, the healing seems to be starting as well. I know that you're a leader in this community, but you're also a mother. So tell me how you're handling this with your young kids and what you're seeing this community do. Well, when the shooter was on the loose and we didn't know who he was and what the motive was, part of us was thinking maybe it's an anti-Asian hate crime. So there was a lot of fear during that time. And um, we're back in the community and more supportive of each other than before. Um, there's messages in the chat about how we're going to support Maria, who is the owner of Star Ballroom, to rebuild this community, come back stronger than ever before. I don't have any fears or qualms about bringing my 13-year-old daughter back here to continue ballroom dancing. I'm not going to stay away from the studio just because of a one-off situation. You're not going to live in fear? No, I'm not. Yeah, and as I'm driving to work this morning, I'm driving by Barnes Park, which is the main park out of many parks in Monterey Park. The neighborhood, the community is out and about. The elderly folks are walking the streets, walking through the park. No one, I know there's some people that are fearful still, but a good chunk of the community are living their lives normally. I'm seeing a lot of people, they're still at the grocery stores, they're still on the street, they're still coming down here, and I think they're they're showing that resilience that you're talking about. Yeah, by by I was at that. restaurants yesterday and today, and there's still a lot of people out and about at restaurants living their lives like normal. Thank you so much. And certainly her strength is palpable. And Lindsay, you can imagine what it's like for this community to have leaders like that, young leaders who are vowing to bring their kids back to this studio. They say they will return. And she said collectively within this WeChat group, it's already starting. The conversations are already happening about how they will continue to support the stance studio. I'm sure we're going to continue to see an outpouring there. Kana Whitworth for us once again in California. Thank you so much. We're joined now by Monterey Park Mayor Henry Lowe. Mayor, thank you so much for joining us during this difficult time for your community. First, what can you tell us about the state of the investigation into the shooter and, and what may have motivated this attack? So right now, um, the investigation is still trying to determine uh, the motive. Um, and so, you know, we, do, we don't know what the motive is, uh, unfortunately. Uh, uh, you know, what we do know is that this is just a very tragic um, crime incident um, that happened during uh, Lunar Weekend Celebration and our community right now is just devastated and in disbelief about what has happened and why it happened in our community. And Monterey Park occupies a unique place in American history as the first suburb with a majority Asian population. For our viewers, just explain what defines your city and what yes. makes it a unique place, especially for the Asian American community there. Well, you know, the, so Monterey Park, as you mentioned, um, it has its history, uh, its distinction of being an ethno suburb, um, uh, with, uh, which has um, attracted people from all over Asia, uh, China, and not just Asia, but also Latin America from different parts of the United States. Um, I mean, in, I mean, in many ways, uh, you know, Mario Park is that melting pot city. Uh, we actually uh, grew up in a community in, in near Mario Park because we unfortunately couldn't afford to live here. Um, but uh, to my parents, uh, Mario Park um, embodied uh, in their vision of what the American dream was, and so when. Uh, you know, their son was able to uh, move in, uh, buy a home, and then eventually become a council member. It was, in many ways, uh, their embodiment of the American dream being reached.
Uh, there were a couple of quotes from Monterey Park residents to the Washington Post that grabbed my attention that I, I just wanted to read to you. Uh, one said, quote, when people ask me about Monterey Park, I think about the food, the people, that I can go outside at 12 a.m. and feel safe. Now that's shattered. And another said, uh, before this, I always thought Monterey Park was the safest place in America. Today, I think it's not safe anywhere. Uh, what do you say to those residents who've had their sense of security shattered? It is uh, just tragic that uh, we now join a list of, of communities across the United States uh, that have witnessed a mass shooting. As a community, it's going to take time to heal. Uh, uh, although I want to say that uh, during this crisis, our police department, uh, are, they have just uh, been incredible in their leadership. Um, they responded to the first calls within three minutes. Um, and working with uh, the FBI, with uh, uh, ATF, um, the uh, county, uh, sheriff's department, uh, the state office of emergency management services. Uh, I mean, in less than 24 hours, uh, the, uh, the suspect uh, essentially was removed from being able to harm anyone ever again. And so, uh, you know, the people of Monterey Park uh, can take heart that uh, they have a police department um, that is committed to their safety. And sadly, you are not the first mayor to have to help his community recover from a senseless mass shooting. What do you plan to do in the coming days and weeks in order to help your community come together and, and try to move forward? I know sure. you said you're still well, um, feeling in shock uh, tomorrow, at the moment. Tomorrow, uh, we're going to be having a vigil around 5.30 uh, for the community to come out and to uh, uh, express their mourning, um, to pay their respects, to remember those Victims, um, we've established a, a memorial in front of um, City Hall for people to place flowers. Um, we have a crisis, uh, a, a crisis center at our uh, senior center right now for uh, not just the victims and their families, but for anyone in our community who is grieving, who is in need of uh, counseling and emotional support, uh, to, or just to make sense of what has transpired in our community. Um, and you know, also just here behind us, you know, we we have the dance hall. And early today, I had an opportunity to also, you know, uh, pay my respects and uh, see so many people who have come to remember, uh, uh, you know, those who have tragically died, and also to remember, you know, this place was a place of of um, uh, dancing, of socializing, um, and uh, unfortunately, uh, it, it, that have all been shattered. We understand that. All right, Monterey Park Mayor Henry Lowe, we thank you so much for your time tonight. Our, our thoughts are certainly with your entire community tonight. Thank you so very much. Now to another deadly shooting, this time in Des Moines, Iowa, at a charter school where two students were killed and a staff member was wounded. Our Alex Perez joins us now. Alex, what do we know about what unfolded there? Well, Lindsay, some unbelievably terrifying moments for parents in Des Moines this afternoon. Now, panicked loved ones rushing to the educational facility in downtown Des Moines as word of the shooting spread. Authorities say two high school age students are dead and an adult staff member remains hospitalized after a shooting inside the facility just before one o'clock this afternoon. Police call the incident targeted and not random. The Starts Right Here program is aimed at young people with behavioral or other issues issues not enrolled in traditional schools. Now, Lindsay, three suspects are in custody. Authorities say an exact motive remains unclear. Lindsay? All right. Alex Perez for us. Thanks so much, Alex. And still to come, why hundreds of bakers in Paris are grabbing their baguettes and hitting the streets in protest. And the dramatic new drone images out of Brazil that show deforestation in the Amazon, what the country's new leader is doing to try to stop it. America's number one news, ABC News. Most watched, most trusted, and streaming live to you anytime, anywhere, and free. This is ABC News Live, America's number one streaming news, free to you 24-7. Watch America's number one news whenever you want it, wherever you are, anytime. ABC News Live, streaming live and free on all platforms. Bring them on. If only there was a place in the morning to start my day. With a smile, somewhere to help me get in the know. 
A place as spectacular as, well, me. Hmm, I think we might know a place, right, guys? Bring your friends. Oh, wait, there is. Good morning, America. GMA, 7A, every day. Boom. 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 Good morning, Michael. Good morning, Robin. Good morning, America. How are you? Boom. Now that's how you start your day, people. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? <laughs> Let's go. How are you? Can I hug you? Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 12 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. We're drowning in information, and it's harder than ever to separate what's trustworthy from what's not. Together, we can stop the flood of misinformation. Let's care before we share. Now streaming on ABC News Live 2020. True crime, cinematic, real-life drama, stunning, the unthinkable. Follow the clues. The Hunt. True crime 2020. Now streaming. Back, we're tracking several headlines around the world. French bakers and their baguettes have taken to the streets in central Paris. Over the cost of operations and materials, some held flares, banners, and bread, calling for the government to give them more financial aid. The French finance minister urged power suppliers to do more to assist small and medium-sized businesses amid the rising power costs as bakers are now forced to raise bread prices up to 50% in order to stay open. In Pakistan, finally some light after the dark as its government has begun restoring power to millions after a breakdown in the grid triggered the worst electricity outage in months. The more than 12-hour outage during peak winter months highlighted the weak infrastructure of the heavily indebted nation. The outage, which officials said was due to a voltage surge, is the second major grid failure in three months. Joe footage captured by Reuters showed deforested Amazon areas in Brazil. The images show patches of trees cut down by livestock farmers. Brazil launched its first raids against illegal deforestation in the Amazon rainforest under President Lula da Silva after the new leaders pledged to end destruction that surged under Bolsonaro. During Lula's first stint as president, Amazon deforestation was reduced by 72 percent. Now to the major developments in Washington, where President Biden is under fire after an unprecedented 13-hour FBI search at his Delaware home over the weekend, which uncovered a fourth batch of classified documents, with some of them dating back as far as the president's time as a senator. That's leaving even some of the president's supporters expressing alarm. ABC senior White House correspondent Mary Bruce has the latest. President Biden arriving back in Washington today after the White House revealed the FBI discovered new classified documents during their unprecedented search of his Delaware home. Mr. President, did you know those documents were there, sir? Were you irresponsible, Mr. President? The White House insists they offered to let the FBI conduct the search. Agents arrived at 945 Friday morning and for nearly 13 hours scoured all working, living and storage spaces of the home. The White House tonight won't say exactly how much classified material was found, just that it was six items consisting of documents with classification markings, some from his time as vice president, others going all the way back to his years in the Senate. It comes roughly six months after FBI agents armed with a warrant retrieved more than 100 classified documents from the Mar-a-Lago home of former President Donald Trump after he refused for months to cooperate. The attorney general today pressed on whether Trump was treated more harshly than Biden. The department has a set of norms and practices. We do not have different rules for Democrats or Republicans, different rules for the powerful or the powerless. Biden has insisted he's done everything by the book. There's no there there. The president says he takes the handling of classified material seriously. We continue to learn about more documents being found and discovered at his home, including now some that go back decades to his time in the Senate. So why should the American people believe that this president takes classified material seriously and the handling of it? He was very clear what, with, with the response of what we're currently seeing. And he says, I take this very seriously. He said, I didn't know uh, that the documents were there. You just said the president said that he did not know the documents were there. I'm not actually sure he has said that that clearly. Are you saying the president did well, not he know said he was surprised. He said he was surprised. 
All right, thanks to Mary Bruce for that. Now to Memphis, where the family of 29-year-old Tyree Nichols is reacting after personally seeing video of the encounter with police that put him in the hospital. He died three days later. After the police department saw that video, all five officers were fired. But will the public get a chance to see it for themselves? Our senior national correspondent, Steve Osinsami, reports. The parents of Tyree Nichols say that what they watched today was so difficult to see, his mother had to close her eyes and walk away. What I saw on the video today was horrific. All my son was trying to do was get home. After weeks of demanding to see what police body cameras recorded, to see what happened to their son, authorities pulled them into an office and shared multiple videos from what started as a traffic stop on January 7th and somehow led to this. He died three days after the incident. Today, his family says they saw police officers kick, pepper spray, and use a stun gun on their 29-year-old son while he asked them, what did I do? Was there a point where he told them that he could or could not breathe? You could see it, but you didn't hear him say it. You could see him struggling. It was clear that he was struggling. Police say they pulled him over for alleged reckless driving and that he ran, but his family says it's clear in the video that the response from officers was excessive. And on that point, Memphis police agree. They have fired all five officers, and they are all the subject of both a state and now federal investigation. The family says the fact that the officers are all African-American doesn't change anything. I hate that it was black police officers that did this to my son. It doesn't matter if the cop is black or white. What we want to see is that they treat our children with the same dignity and respect that they treat everybody else. Steve Osinsami joins us now. Steve, how is the family reacting? You know, the family's just devastated. The mother who, you know, I talked with and, and sat across from today um, is heartbroken. You know, she talks about, you know, being at home and waiting for her son to walk through the door. This was her youngest son. Um, she said, you know, that he was a, a, a good kid. And she says, you hear that a lot, but in this case, he was a good kid. She talks about things that she remembers from her son, the fact that he really enjoyed watching the sunset every day. Um, they are devastated, they are heartbroken, and, and they want justice. Understandably so. Steve Osinsami, our thanks to you. We turn next to the four members of the far-right Oath Keepers militia who have been found guilty of seditious conspiracy to stop the certification of the 2020 presidential election. It follows the conviction of the group's leader, Stuart Rhodes, in November. The charge is the most serious to be brought in connection with the Capitol siege. Here's ABC's Chief Justice Correspondent, Pierre Thomas. Tonight, four members of the Oath Keepers militia convicted of seditious conspiracy, of plotting to prevent Joe Biden from becoming president so Donald Trump could remain in office and their plan to use armed violence. Prosecutors proved that Edward Vallejo was at this Virginia hotel with this stockpile of assault rifles on standby as part of a quick reaction force. During the trial, prosecutors played this chilling podcast of Vallejo on January 6th discussing the potential for armed rebellion. The American people are going to be told today that we have a liberty and justice for all, or they're going to be told And if they're told that's going to be the declaration of a guerrilla war. This is the second time in recent weeks that a jury has decided that the violence on January 6th was a product of a premeditated, organized conspiracy, not some spontaneous event. Let's get right to Pierre Thomas. Uh, Pierre, there was another high-profile conviction today in connection with January 6th. What are the details there? Yes, Lindsay, tonight another victory for DOJ. Richard Barnett, who was photographed with his feet on the desk of an office in then-Speaker Nancy Pelosi's office, was convicted today. He's one of more than 900 suspects charged in connection with January 6th. Nearly 500 have been convicted so far, Lindsay. All right, Pierre Thomas for us from the nation's capital. Pierre, our thanks as always. Next to the back-to-back -back storms making a beeline across the country tonight. More than 20 states are on alert from Arizona to Maine. The second storm ramming the Gulf tomorrow before it's set to head north. Our chief meteorologist Ginger Z is tracking it all for us. Hey, Ginger. 
Hey, Lindsay, biting cold and blustery wind behind storm number one that brought up to 15 inches of snow in Lewiston, Maine. Well, that is about to move all the way out, but Rhode Island, uh, just eastern Connecticut and Massachusetts still dealing with the clip of it. Once that gets through, the cold settles in, but we focus on storm two, and that one developed with even southern Arizona picking up snow earlier today. That will move across in places like Oklahoma City to St. Louis will get the snow on the order of three to six inches in some of the higher spots. But you see that really dark red line that's just east of the low. That's the severe storm line that I would be most concerned tomorrow afternoon through the evening hours. It's not just damaging wind because it looks very linear in that picture we showed you earlier, but there can be isolated tornadoes that spin up on there. So anyone that is around Houston, South Texas there, Southeast Texas into New Orleans, Mobile, Pensacola, Destin. That is going to be a long afternoon and evening of watching the potential for those severe storms to turn into tornadoes. And eventually, Lindsay, that is the same storm that will kind of come together and bring us potentially our first measurable snow of the season just days before we don't break a record then if that happens on Wednesday. Because remember, we'd have to make to January 29th in New York City without measurable snow. We're almost there, but we might just not get there because we might get it on Wednesday, it looks like. <laughs> I think you want to get it. I, I, I bet you're anticipating I do. The snow. <laughs> I say, hey, we made it this far. What's a quarter inch? That's not, that's not worth it, but all right. All right, Ginger, <laughs> hope you can go get warm. Thank you. Still to come as we process yet another senseless mass shooting with a tragedy in California. We reflect on a city united in grief. Our John Quinona sits down with a Robb Elementary staffer on life after a shooting and how she's beginning to heal. I'm innocent. I am innocent. I am innocent. How annoying that you just said all this innocent stuff for so long and you're really guilty. She would throw things. <laughs> It was like working with a 40-year-old child. The housewife scam, the real life of Jen Shaw. Six and a half years in federal prison. Jen Shaw, a fraud. This is Impact by Nightline, now streaming on Hulu. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any place else. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir. America's number one most watched newscast. Now streaming on ABC News Live. After an extraordinary newsmaking year, thank you for making ABC's This Week America's number one news and politics show on Sunday mornings. From America's number one news source comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and it can customize to you and your interests. If you love being in the know, you're gonna love this. Experience what all the buzz is about. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. Reporting from Quincy, Massachusetts, I'm Stephanie Ramos. Wherever the story is, we will take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Welcome back. On a night where we try to process yet another mass shooting in our country, we turn now to Uvalde, Texas, a community that lost 19 children and two teachers in a school shooting last year. Is a town still trying to heal? Among them, a Robb Elementary School staffer who faced false accusations. Tonight, an update from our John Quinones, who's been reporting in Uvalde for months now. And this one comes with a bit of a silver lining. The Robb Elementary staffer at the center of controversy speaking out. Emilia Amy Marin, after the trauma she underwent following the mass shooting last May. I tell myself that I have to be strong and I have to stay positive and think positive. We told Amy's story on GMA last October, how she was falsely accused by Texas authorities of leaving a back door open at the school, the door through which the shooter entered on May 24th and began his rampage. The exterior door where we knew the shooter entered was propped open by a teacher. He said, a teacher left the door propped open. And I looked at my daughter and I said, that's a lie. The Texas Department of Public Safety had actually not named her. That was done by Amy's lawyer as her name spread in Uvalde. Her lawyer demanding an apology. The DPS later retracted their statement that a teacher had left the door open, admitting that Amy 
had closed the door behind her. Security video clearly showed that. DPS director Steve McCraw apologized. But by then, Amy felt vilified in her own community. When we met her last fall, her body shook. She spoke with a stutter, suffering from anxiety and depression. After we told Amy's story on GMA, she received letters from all over the country. I am a retired teacher of 43 years. I can put myself in your place. Do not let this destroy your health and future happiness. The woman once considered a pariah in her own town is doing better now, thanks to all that support and therapy, including treatment sessions with a therapy dog. What did those letters do for you? They give me strength. They give me courage. I read them because I want to remind myself uh, that there's people out there that are praying for me. Since the shooting, Amy had refused to even go past Robb Elementary. But a few days ago, she asked ABC News to come with her. And with her daughter at her side, Amy finally walked to the front gates of the school, where she made an impassioned plea to the part of her still inside that building. I want me to get out of there. Such powerful reporting from John Quinones. That is our show for tonight. Be sure to stay tuned to ABC News Live for more context and analysis of the day's top stories. I'm Lindsay Davis. Thank you so much for streaming with us. Have a good night.